What's cracking, YouTube? Welcome back to the HQ, the headquarters where we get in the muck every Monday. Today, we are going over two fourth year wide receivers who get breakout hype every single year, but are yet to break out. If you haven't guessed it by the thumbnail, we're talking about Devontae Parker, we're talking about Jamison Crowder. I hadn't really dove into either of these two players yet this year, and I knew. I didn't want to because I knew it was going to end up being a fucking headache to do it because I had no idea what I thought about the players prior to this video. Which of the two, if any, are safe to draft? We do break out some good statistics on both of these players that hopefully will make your decision a little bit easier. Both guys going picked after pick 90, but prior to pick 100. So in the same range, you'll probably have to choose between one of the two. And that's really it. So we're about to get in the muck, as we always do in the muck Mondays, baby. Comparing two players, let's just get cracking. So I'm filming this on Wednesday, July 25th. So this is actually like five days prior to this thing actually coming out. If you're watching this on Monday morning, I'm probably passed away. I might still be alive, but if I am, I'm in bed. I'm, I'm right there recovering because I'm leaving for Orlando tomorrow morning early. I got my friend's wedding Saturday, so we're just kind of going to be partying from Thursday till Sunday. And then Monday, Tuesday will be my recovery days. So, film this up early, just letting you know. So, in case we have reports coming out of training camp about Parker or Crowder from Wednesday to Sunday, won't be in here. But I'll give you the best breakdown I can at this given point in time. We'll start with Devontae Parker. Being picked 97th overall, wide receiver 38. Jameson Crowder is 92 overall, wide receiver 37. So, back to back and wide receiver ADPs, as well as five spots apart overall. So, both getting picked between, like I said, the 90 and 100 range. Parker is somewhat of an enigma in fantasy football, as I feel like like 90% of players are enigmas in fantasy football. People assume that since he's built like A.J. Green, right, he's long, he's lean, he's fast, he's sub 6% body fat, that he should put up the same type of numbers that A.J. Green does, which hasn't been the case. Dating back to his rookie year in 2015 when he was drafted, uh, Parker was the 14th overall pick from the Miami Dolphins in the first round, obviously. He has yet to catch more than 57 passes in a year. He has yet to go over 744 receiving yards in a year. He has yet to hit pay dirt and score four tutties in a given year. He's dealt with a lot of injuries. That was like his, he got that injury prone tag early in the year. And that was why a lot of people wanted to stay away from him afterwards. But, you know, the fantasy football community does man we're always looking for that elusive breakout year you'll hit, you'll miss three out of four seasons but if you hit on that one year it's possible that he wins you the chip and that's why guys like parker and jameson crowder are so highly touted and and such topics of conversation throughout the summer i wanted to look back and kind of tell the story of parker's career because it leads up to what i think is going to happen in 2018 you look back at 2015 his rookie season parker played in only eight games right he missed eight games due to injury he posted 26 receptions, 494 receiving yards, and three scores. Um, it was actually a really, really good year, his rookie year, from a statistical standpoint. Among the 97 wide receivers in the NFL in 2015 that saw at least 40 targets, Parker ranked second in the NFL in yards per reception. He was, he was averaging 19.0 yards per reception. Again, second in the NFL among 97 wide receivers that saw 40 targets or more. He was fourth in yards per target, and he had the ninth, ninth highest average depth of target, 15.9. So every target he saw down the field was 16 yards. When you pace those numbers out, right, the 26, 494, three scores to a full 16 game pace, you're getting 52 catches, 988 yards, and six touchdowns, which is really, really good for a rookie season by all accounts and much better than the rookie seasons that we've seen over the last three, four years because these first-round uh, these first round rookies have been horrible over the last few years. So when he was on the field, he was putting up good numbers for you. In 2016, however, he took a little bit of a step back. He played in 15 of 16 games. He played most of the year. He caught 56 passes. He had a career-high 744 yards and four tuds. He and Tannehill started gaining somewhat of a connection there, right? We saw flashes, but it was completely inconsistent from Parker's side in terms of separation, in terms of beating press coverage. 
these problems that we saw in, in college still lingered. And we've seen Parker kind of become a player that tries to out-athlete people. Because when you're playing at Louisville and you don't have the kind of competition that you would at like an SEC defense, you don't get... Uh, you don't need to be a precise route runner. You don't need to be really crispy like chicken tenders in that sense of the game to be uh, really productive in college. And he just used his athleticism size and, size and speed, which he has great measurables in that sense of to win a lot of the time in college. But that doesn't always translate into the NFL. However, in, uh, you know, in 2016, Tannehill will go on and tear his ACL in week 14 of that year after being on pace to set career highs with a 67.1 completion rate. 4.9% touchdown rate, which would have tied Philip Rivers and been right below Kirk, Big Ben, Alex Smith, and Matt Stafford in 2017. So uh, Ryan Tannehill was on pace for a really good year in 2016 compared to a lot of players that played well last year in 2017. He didn't get surgery. He ended up tearing the entire ACL a few months later in August and missed all of the 2017 season. So Parker had to deal with a blend of Jay Cutler, Matt Moore, and some dude named David Fall Fowles, Falls, I don't know, someone... Talk to me about that fraud down down in the comment section, please. Last year, he finished with 57 catches, 670 yards, and one score. That was Devonta Parker's stats in 2017 in just 13 games. However, there were a few positives to take away, in my opinion, from this season. Parker started off really, 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 really hot in the 2017 campaign. In Miami's first three games, these were Parker's stat lines. Four for 85, seven for, oh, eight for six. I'm going to try this over. There's a lot of numbers on my screen, and I'm, like, going off dyslexic and shit. Okay, first three games, 4 for 85, 8 for 76, and a touchdown, 6 for 69. Seeing at least eight targets in all three. And those are against good pass defenses. Those are against the Chargers, the Jets, and the Saints. So putting up really good numbers, seeing a lot of volume against good pass defenses. He would suffer a high ankle sprain in the next game, which caused him to miss that game week five before returning in week nine um those three if you look at just those three games and i hate you know the, doing small sample size to pace it out but i feel like it's notable nonetheless if you pace those three games out those first three games when he was fully healthy against good defenses to a 16 game pace he's catching 96 balls on 144 targets 1227 yards and 5.3 touchdowns guys obviously like i said it's naive to project over a small sample size but it's noteworthy um you don't know how the year would have turned out had he not had that high ankle sprain right high ankle sprain is is an injury any of those lower leg injuries are things that linger for the most part and are tough to get back to 100 percent on and for the most part you're playing the rest of the year at less than 100 percent and not uh, at your full strength and full capabilities of what you could be doing middle of their schedule once he returned from that high ankle sprain, he, I don't think he was ever at 100% again. Parker was really bad for the next like five or six games. From weeks 9 to 14, he returned in, in week 9. From 9 to 14, he didn't top 80 yards once um, or score a single touchdown in any of those games. So he was pretty much unusable in fantasy for that entire portion of the season. He would finish the year really, really strong, though, on the last three games. Uh, he went 6 for 89, 5 for 63, and then 6 for 64, um, 29 targets. So almost 10, almost 10 targets a game on their last three games, weeks 15, 16, and 17. So we saw him start off the year really strong. We saw him end the year really strong. Heading into 2018, the big storyline here is obviously that Jarvis Landry is gone, who saw at least 27% of the team's targets um, since Parker has arrived in Miami in 2015. That's a huge, huge void. And according to Evan Silva's team outlook on the Dolphins, the Dolphins have 290 team targets up for grabs, and the second, which is the second highest total among any team entering the 2018 season. Um, it's 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 ludicrous. It'd be asinine to believe that those those targets automatically go to Parker because Landry, we know, is a guy who gets those short over the middle targets. Parker is more of a deep threat, uh, an outside guy. They bring in Albert Wilson. Signed for three years, $24 million. So that's that's pretty good money for a wide receiver coming from the Chiefs. Uh, they bring in Danny Amendola, two years, $12 million. They also use their second-round pick on the freak tight end, Mike Gesicki, out of Penn State. So the targets will, although there's a lot of them, right? There's 290. They will disperse among Albert Wilson. They will disperse among Gesicki. They will disperse among Stills and Devontae Parker on the outside. So we're at the point where if the Parker breakout is coming, it's going to be in 2018. He has the clear path to take over as the wide receiver one in this offense now that Landry is gone. 
Uh, they get rid of Jay Ajayi. They get rid of Jarvis Landry. So it seems like under Adam Gase, he's trying to open up the offense more and, and have it more of a, a downfield kind of offense, right? You have Kenyon Drake coming in there. He's more of a playmaker than a full running back. Um, so I think they're trying to spread the ball a little more, which is good for Devontae Parker. However, I, I think the biggest question mark to answer here is, is Devonta Parker actually any good? Is he a good wide receiver? We know his size and we know his speed. If you just look at him on player profile, right? 6'3", 210 pounds, runs a 4'4", 40-yard dash, which puts him in the 89th percentile in terms of speed score. But like I said, to be a true wideout number one in the NFL, you need to be more than just a great athlete. You need to be able to beat man coverage and press coverage because you're always going to be facing the opposing team's number one cornerback on the outside. And if you can't outplay him and out strategic him and out tactic him, you're not going to be able to beat him and you're not going to be able to uh, succeed in the NFL. Per player profiler, Parker Parker's 1.05 yards of separation per target ranked 98th among NFL wide receivers last year. I wanted to look at, like I always do with the wide receivers, look at both that number as well as how Matt Harmon graded Parker out in reception perception, which is his awesome column breaking down gameplay, actual game film from these wide receivers. And what we've seen is Parker's success rate has actually gone up in each of his three seasons in the NFL so far, which is good but he is yet to finish higher than the 11th percentile in success versus man or press coverage, meaning he lacks technique on a lot of his routes when he's seeing press and man coverage. He ran 90% of his routes from the X receiver position on the line of scrimmage last year, seeing man coverage on nearly 68% of his routes. So he's going to need to improve that part of his game if he's going to be their number one. There is a little bit of good news on that front though. You know, um, I mean, this is, we'll take this how you want to. First, supposedly per the Miami beat reporters and, and the team and the camp in Miami who are honestly second to none, the best hype men you could ever possibly ask for. They don't even care if you suck. They, they, can, they might know you suck. They're still sprouting out hype for you and telling you that Julius Thomas is scoring 42 touchdowns in 2017. Parker is breaking out as a wide receiver one overall, better than Antonio Brown, better than Julio. That's what the beat reporters basically said last season. They're a little quieter this season, but they are saying that Parker is, one of his problems has always been work ethic, work ethic and, and working hard to perfect his craft. Supposedly he is first one in, last one out of the building, which is good because he's gonna need to watch a lot of tape and improve his technique. So take that for what it's worth, what they're saying. Secondly, he's been an excellent receiver in contested situations, like contested catch situation, which is an absolute must if you're going to be a receiver who can't separate on main coverage. Because if you can't separate, the guy's still on your back, but you're able to make the play in contested catches, that's uh, something that could keep you on the field and keep you seeing targets and volume. Last year, he caught over 59% of the contested targets thrown his way. 10th highest percentage in the NFL last year. So he's a top 10 receiver in terms of contested catches. Lastly, bringing in Albert Wilson is a good thing in my opinion per what the reports are saying out of camp. They're saying that Albert Wilson, although you might think of him as like a slot receiver, uh, he's been moving around a lot. They're saying he's learning all the positions. So not only the X receiver, the Z receiver, the slot receiver in this offense as well. So it's good because if you're putting him on the outside, that means you're going to be moving guys like Stills and Parker's all, Parker all around as well. So Parker might see more snaps on the inside. They might see him playing the slot more, which is great because he doesn't need to separate from man coverage if he's playing more in the slot. So his offense is probably going to be more diverse and they're going to be moving around more now that this is Gase. It's Gase's third year in Miami as their, uh, as their coach, but it's his second full year with Ryan Tannehill as the quarterback, you know, learning this new offense. So or third. either way, it's the next year in this offense between Gase and Tannehill. And we see a lot of quarterbacks like we're probably going to see from the Falcons and, and what we saw from the Falcons 2015 to 2016 and other examples. We see a lot of times the quarterbacks and the offenses as a whole take a much bigger second step or a much bigger step into the second year of like a coach and offensive cohesion. And uh, we could definitely see that happening between Tannehill and Gase and Parker. So um, if he's moved around more in the slot, then you're going to see, or as the flanker, you're going to see him uh, be able to create separation a lot easier. The last thing that I thought was interesting was Parker's usage in the 10 zone in 2016 when Tannehill was the quarterback. That was Tannehill's last healthy season. Um, Parker led the team in 10 zone targets and the percentage of team targets during that part of the at that part of the field. Tannehill liked throwing it to his big target down there. In 2017, when it wasn't Tannehill, the target shifted heavily in favor of Jarvis Landry, who saw the second most 10 zone targets among all NFL wide receivers. 
And he, in 2016, that number was way, 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 way lower when Tannehill was the quarterback. I think Jarvis Landry saw like four or five 10 zone targets. 2017, when it wasn't Tannehill anymore, that number jumped up to 14, which was, again, the second most among all NFL wide receivers. And we saw Parker lead the team when it was Tannehill under center, not Jay Cutler. Jarvis Landry is gone, right? Those 14 10 zone targets are up for grabs again with the QB who has already shown that he likes to throw to Parker down there at that part of the field. So Parker is a huge target, um, typically towers over the cornerbacks at that part of the field. The guy who can get up, he is, he does have AJ Green-like attributes in that he can get up, pinpoint the ball very high and does tower over the defender. So I could totally see him seeing a huge portion of the targets at that part of the field. So really there's a lot of val uh, volume to be had here in Miami. Um, but in order for Parker to really take advantage of it, he does need to work on his craft. And all reports so far are positive in saying that he is working harder to make sure that that is a better part of his game. Um, so I like what we're seeing out of Parker, and I like what we're seeing in terms of his outlook for 2018. Uh, but let's jump into my man, Jamison Crowder. Before we do so, I want to thank today's sponsors for today's video. FantasyJocks.com they are the industry leaders, fantasy sports industry leaders in all your league needs. I'm talking about championship belts, championship trophies, championship rings, draft boards for your live draft for your league. These things are very high, high quality. I've had this thing for about four years and we've had absolutely no problems with it. Only compliments to the chef. You can get your team's names engraved on the belts. Each year someone wins a chip, send that, send that bad boy out to Fantasy Jocks and tell them, listen boy, I want the Dominican Sud, dude, listed right there on the engravement, because you know your boy brought home the chip. But yeah, just just have your league. Oh no, this is stuck. Have your league mates ship in five, six, eight, nine, twelve dollars each, and grab yourself one of these bad boys. It is so much better playing for something than just money or bragging rights. Have something physical, tangible on the line for you and your boys or girls, homies, homets. We don't discriminate here at BDGE. And, uh, and I promise you, you will not be disappointed by the quality of the product they have. They were awarded the number one um, championship trophies per the Fantasy Sports Trade Association, which is like the main association for all fantasy sports. They won that award. This is legit, guys, I'm telling you. So go check out their website, fantasyjocks.com. Use promo code TAKE10 or TACO Corp, T-A-C-O-C-O-R-P for 10% off your purchase your man's just hooking you up. So fantasyjocks.com, thank you for sponsoring today's video. Go check out their website. And uh, I actually need to refuel on some coffee, so I'll be right back. All right, we bike. Got my coffee. You know what's funny? It's actually not really that funny at all, but my my aunt got me a, this as a, as a gift last year or two years ago for Christmas. It's the giant mug of hangovers. It basically explains all the hangovers because... Whenever we have like family events, like I'm, I'm, my family's, a, we're like a very white family. Like we do like very white things and we have like birthday parties for our family members. And when it's like holidays, we all get together and have big parties and whatnot. But every time we do these things, it's always on a Sunday. It's always on like Sunday at like 11 a.m. it starts. And like your man's is not necessarily a saint on Saturday nights. You know, I like my Marg, you know, I like my tequila and whatnot. So for the most part, I mean, I'm young, I'm 25, right? And this is, I mean, this has been going on for five years now. We have our parties on Sunday mornings whenever we do. Like this, actually, this last Sunday, we had my, my little cousin graduated from high school and we had a, a, a brunch on uh, on Sunday at 10.30. Uh, the night before, I was at the smoking Meats and Clapping Cheeks party from like 11 a.m. until midnight that night. So I woke up in my bed at like 9.45. I legit, I deadass had the meat sweats. I ate so, by the end of the night, Steve made so much food. By the end of the night, like there was trays of pulled pork and I was eating them shits like it was, they were chips, like potato chips. So I woke up the next morning in a sweat. My mom is like, Nick, we gotta go to brunch in like 20 minutes. I'm like, what? And you know, I mean, you know, your man still rallied and started drinking mimosas at brunch and I ate a full, I think it was a cheesesteak. I'm nasty sometimes, bro. But anyways, back to the point. Um, I forget what the point was. But yeah. Oh, yeah. We have our parties on Sundays. So I get there and I'm always hungover because I'm, I'm usually going out late the night before. And I just go, I just find the first couch that comes into my eyesight, my vision, and I pass out on the couch. So they like know me. I'm like the family member that's, I think they think I'm an alcoholic. But like I have my shit together. Like I work really hard. But every time that we have, they only see me on Sundays. So it becomes a problem, you know? Anyone have a solution for that? I should probably stop drinking. I feel like my life would be a whole lot more productive. I might do that. 
but only after the summer stops because I got the wedding this weekend. So, oh, damn, I'm going to be drinking for like three straight days. Then I'm going to Cancun on vacation from the 8th to the 12th. Me and my friends got an all-inclusive resort four nights, so I'm probably going to be drinking triple-digit Mars within a three-day period. That's going to be fucking horrible. Oh, my God. My heart just hurt thinking about that. Weekend after that, we got the E-Town Get Down Punishment. So we're going out to... Uh, this bar a couple towns over from me, and the last place loser of my fantasy league is going to be a bathroom attendant there for the night while we're all partying the night away. The week after that, we have the draft weekend, live NYC draft weekend, man, where 90 y'all are coming to stay with me at an Airbnb from Friday to Sunday. Oh, man, this Airbnb is going to, the Airbnb is incredible. It's fucking dope. Um, we actually had one per the last slot, the eight people are fully paid for. We had one spot open up because someone had uh, an unexpected surgery that they're having in August, so he can't come. So as of this video, we might still have one slot open. I think the last person actually said they were in, but we might still have one slot open. If you're interested in doing the live draft weekend in NYC, it is the price is $10.99. So $1 short of $1,100, so that is the price. So if you're not interested in paying that price, please don't reach out to me. There's payment plans for it. That price does include the Airbnb for the three nights as well as all food for the weekend. The draft is being catered. We're gonna go out to restaurants, hang out. All drinks is for the bar is gonna be stocked in the house, along with a bunch of other stuff that I have planned for us to do. So awesome weekend. If you are interested at that price, make sure you shoot me an email, nick at bigdogsfantasy.com. It might be taken by now, but anyways, let's jump back into the video because I've done enough mammering about this bullshit. Jameson Crowder, wide receiver for the Red Skeons. Crowder is basically exactly the same, but also at the same time exactly different. So different from Parker in the sense that he's a fourth year wide receiver, plenty of breakout potential, plenty of breakout hype. Um, but in terms of how they are as players, they couldn't be more different. Crowder is a slot receiver, about 5'8", 185 pounds. He runs good routes. He excels against zone coverage um, off the line of scrimmage, exactly the opposite of where Devontae Parker runs his routes. Given the change in quarterbacks in Washington um, and some of the turnover at the wide receiver position, we have to you know, account for that when we're looking at the 2018 outlook for Jamison Crowder. After a mini breakout campaign in 2016, which is what we saw from him, he caught 67 passes for 847 yards and seven scores. People were hyped. People were like, yep, this is his real breakout, breakout campaign in 2017. I'm sorry, I got to fix this again. Crowder actually regressed in all three categories. Uh, he went from 67 down to 66 catches, 847 yards down to 789, and that seven touchdown mark went down to three. He injured his right hip right before the first game of the season last year. Then he pulled a hammy in week four. So it was really hard to get a grasp on how healthy Crowder was. And when you have injuries like that, they're obviously going to affect you. But nonetheless, the beginning of the season was just awful for Crowder. Look at the first six games of the year. Not a single touchdown was scored. He averaged under 25 receiving yards a game over the first six games. Completely unusable, and you absolutely were starting him in your flex probably for the first two, if not three games. Now, the tough part for his outlook is really figuring out whether or not this was injury-related or this is a uh, chart that I compiled looking at Jordan Reed and Chris Thompson's involvement. So was it injury-related or was it the fact that Jordan Reed and Chris Thompson were both playing in the beginning of the season for the most part? Now, this chart is looking at Jordan Reed and Chris Thompson's snap count percentages by week and then looking at Jameson Crowder's uh, fantasy production, half-point PPR. So the four rows that I've highlighted are the four rows in which both Jordan Reed and Chris Thompson played in over 40% of the team's snaps. So both of them had to have played a lot. What you're seeing in those games is really poor fantasy production from Crowder. 0 0.9 points, 6.7, 4.1, 4.1. So awful production when we saw both of them on the field at the same time. Again, though, it was the beginning of the year when Crowder was dealing with those injuries. So do we chalk it up to him playing a much smaller role when Chris Thompson and Jordan Reed are playing because those are similar guys and getting the similar targets that are short over the over the middle of the field or was it injury related? We It's it's really hard to tell. And when you look at the individual splits uh, in terms of Crowder's production for the last two years with Jordan Reed playing, you see that then without splits for that are much worse from a fantasy production standpoint. Well, not much worse, but you drop from like 10 and a half points to eight and a half points is obviously going to affect your team and obviously going to affect Crowder's production, right? You see his yards drop off by about 13 yards, his targets drop off by about half a target, which is not huge. His touchdowns drop off a little bit, obviously, because Jordan Reed is a much better red zone target. And then you look at Jameson Crowder with and without Chris Thompson. It's it's just overall, it's just a hit either, either time. When either of those guys are playing, you see Crowder's numbers are affected over the last two years, it's been the case. So 
The major concern here is just how involved can Crowder really get when they have Jordan Reed, Chris Thompson, Paul Richardson, Josh Doxson, and a likely renewed running game with Darius Geis. He has seen an increase in targets and targets per game in the three straight seasons, but it wasn't a big increase from 2016 to 2017, um, and he played a large majority of the year while Thompson, Reed, and Terrell Pryor were sidelined. So, so even though it was an increase in targets, it, it's almost a situation with Devin Funches and Christian McCaffrey. Like they got such a high volume of targets, you don't expect it to happen again because all of their all of the weapons on the team were also hurt. So he has he was forced into a bigger role. Now there are three positives I see when I think about Crowder's 2018 fantasy outlook. First of all, one, he's healthy entering the year. These are the reports. He feels great, apparently. I feel great now. It was frustrating when you go out there with a lingering injury. You're already setting yourself behind. That was from Crowder this year in uh, the, uh, this summer, a recent quote by him. He is also entering a contract year. And if you guys follow me, you know I don't care about the contract year theory. You're not going to be like no one plays that much better because they're like, oh, I'm going to contract year. I'm actually going to try this game as opposed to not trying. But the one thing I will say is if a guy like Crowder gets kind of banged up, he's much more likely to play through it. So um, if he's like questionable or if he might be limited, he's much more likely to play through an injury, which is a positive thing because you get him in the lineup at least. So being on the contract year, he will fight to stay on the field. So he's healthy, and if he's not, he'll probably fight to stay on the field regardless. Number two, Alex Smith is the quarterback in Washington now. You know, he takes over for Kirk Cousins. Now, Smith had that an incredible year in KC last year, but it was obviously a complete outlier of a year. He's been in the league since 2000, I think, eight or nine, and he is a short thrower. If we've ever, he might be the premier short thrower in the history of the NFL. Last year, he transitioned into a beast through the air, um, and he was like sixth in the league in deep ball attempts. He was first in deep ball accuracy and completion percentage, but it was very likely because he had Tariq Hill and Travis Kelsey, Kelsey, two of the premier deep threats at their respective positions. Per player profiler, the Chiefs led the NFL in receiver target separation in 2017, so a large part of that had to do with just having Hill and Kelsey there. Um, no surprise there. But what I did was dive a little bit deeper into Alex Smith's history. His average depth of target, NFL rank. So I'm looking back from 20, 2009 all the way through 2017. I looked at his average depth of throw. This is per pro football focus. As you can see, the highest ranking he ever had was 32nd among quarterbacks. In 2013, 14, and 15, he was dead last among quarterbacks in average depth of target. Obviously, this plays well into Crowder's hands because Crowder's a slot guy who also does not average deep targets. The ninth lowest average depth of all wide receiver average depth of target for all wide receivers in 2016, and the sixth lowest last year. Per NBC Washington's Rich Tandler, Jameson Crowder and Alex Smith have displayed a very good rapport during Redskins OTAs. Uh, Smith was very comfortable firing the ball into Crowder during goal line work. So they're gaining a good chemistry, which is good because when a new quarterback comes in, everything is up for grabs, right? Just because maybe you've been a proven player or the old regime likes what you've done doesn't mean that you're going to step right into that role again, which is why I kind of like Stefan Diggs over Adam Thielen in Minnesota because with Kirk coming in, doesn't automatically mean that Thielen is getting 145 targets again. But if we're seeing good rapport for them already, that's good. Uh, that's a good outlook for the 2018 season. According to NFL Next Gen Stats, Smith ranked 20th in average completed pass yards. 6.3 yards per pass, and Smith was the second lowest out of all qualified quarterbacks in throwing into aggressive and tight windows when you consider that Crowder ranked eighth among all wide receivers in separation yards last year. 3.2 average yards of separation on his targets. It's likely that Smith is going to lean on Crowder. They're like a, they're a really good match for each other is what I'm trying to get at. Again, though, Crowder is not the only short area uh, target on the team, which is something you need to kind of take into consideration. The last piece of this puzzle that I think might help us kind of explain why 2017 was a down year for Crowder outside of the injuries uh, was looking at Matt Harmon's reception perception. Crowder is awful at lining up against press coverage and man coverage on the outside. He ranks in the third percentile in success versus press coverage, the third percentile. So 97% of players are better than him at doing so. And we saw him run routes against press and man coverage 23.5% uh, of the time last year, which was up from 12.5% in 2016 during his mini breakout year. So last year, the Skins never really had a point in time when they had multiple outside weapons. Uh, Thrill Pryor got hurt, so it really forced Crowder to move around a lot, and he wasn't be able to, he couldn't just stay in the slot the entire time. Um, now you have, obviously, Josh Doxson coming in as uh, his second year or his third year. 
um, should be solidified on the outside. They also bring in Paul Richardson to be that opposite weapon across the field from him. So Crowder should have that slot completely manned by himself, and he shouldn't have to move outside and move around the field too much. So that's where he has his success, and that's where he should be playing a lot from in 2018. The other thing that people probably aren't really taking into consideration is the fact that Ryan Grant is also gone. He he ends up in, uh, in, in the Colts after he was finagled by the Ravens, but... We're not here to talk about that. Ryan Grant, low-key, was getting a lot of snaps in this offense and, and a decent amount of production that came from Kirk Cousins. He played in uh, 50% or more of the team's snaps in 12 of 16 games and quietly accounted for 13% of Kirk's targets and completions and 14% of his passing yards, 15% of his passing touchdowns. So, for whatever reason, Ryan Grant was getting a lot of playtime and he was actually competing with Jameson Crowder for those numbers. Uh, so he's gone. So that's low-key a little bit of a boost to Jameson Crowder's floor. Now, to wrap this up, to get to the conclusion, well, if you've enjoyed the video thus far before I give my conclusion, I'll, I, I want to know who you guys are taking still. Obviously, leave a comment down below who you wanted prior to the video, who you want after the video, uh, and hit that thumbs up button, of course, if you found value, because I work hard on these videos. If you found value from the video, please hit that thumbs up button. Let me know that you're enjoying these In The Muck Mondays. Um, the conclusion is still very tough for me to break down who I want more. So I put this little this little chart together. Now, Crowder comes up cream. Cash rules everything around me for most things on this chart. But this is kind of like a head versus heart thing for me. Head versus that thing down there. Because Crowder just never got me hard. He just never sank my submarine. Um, you know, I, I see that Crowder wins a lot of those those categories for me. Better route runner, technique, his efficiency, um, better quarterback play. I would take Alex Smith over Ryan Tannehill. The offense overall, Washington should be a lot better. Uh, the floor is better just because he's going to be a PPR, a good PPR play. Injury concern, he has less because Devontae Parker has dealt with a lot of injuries. However, the two spots that Parker, I believe, wins is opportunity and upside. With all those targets up for grabs in Miami and the upside, and just in terms of Parker being the wide receiver, clear wide receiver one in this offense, those are two things that I really like in my fantasy players. So although Crowder is probably the smarter decision, me personally, I will be taking Devontae Parker over Jameson Crowder in drafts because I just don't see Jameson Crowder really capitalizing on the 96 targets that he saw in 2017. There's no telling if Jordan Reed is going to suit up or not, but Chris Thompson is, is going to be healthy and he should be fine for the 2018 season. Jordan Reed, I don't know, but if he ends up playing double-digit games, Jordan Reed and Chris Thompson are really going to hurt Jamison Crowder's overall volume. So, I don't know. I'm, I'm an upside kind of guy, especially that late in the draft. Devonta Parker is the guy I would be taking over Jameson Crowder, but it's still very tough for me, and it's just still a tough decision. I hope I hope you got some value from this, and I hope this helps you like decide um, or get an outlook of, of, of these two different players. And if it did, please, again, make sure you give that video a thumbs up. Um, subscribe to the channel if you're new. If you've missed any of the In the Muck Monday videos, simply just head to my channel, and they'll all be listed there. Every Monday, I put out a video breaking down two players that are being drafted around each other or kind of in the same tier, and uh, that's what I've been doing for the last month and a half or so. And you guys seem to enjoy these videos, so I'm going to keep them coming. I'm going to keep the muck mucky. I'm going to keep big facts only. You can, you can grab this shirt on the website right now if you want. Big facts only. I was about to say bigfactsonly.com. I, I kind of want to start a podcast that's not fantasy football related and name it Big Facts Only. Just bring like two or three of my friends on and we just talk life, liberty, love, pursuit of happiness. You know what I'm saying? Just big facts only. That would be the name of it. But bigdogsfantasy.com if you want to cop the shirt, if you want to cop the draft guide, which is available right now and updated every single week throughout the summer. It's my personal BDGE 2018 fantasy football draft guide. You don't need to go nowhere else to prep for your draft besides that draft guide. All up on the site, available now. So um, thank you again for joining me. Thumb it up. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. And I'll see you all on Wednesday. Peace.